Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Here to talk all things hockey are your hosts, Brad Crisco, Ryan Hanna, and Evan Lobsinger. All right, Brad, last episode, you were incredibly ill. Glad to see you're feeling at least somewhat better. Uh, that episode, I'll give you the gist of it. The Red Wings had some pretty poor performances, didn't gain more than a point really in the in the crucial games that they had, and yet somehow they're still in the playoff race. So this episode, the Red Wings had some pretty poor performances, didn't gain really more than a point in crucial games that they needed to win, and somehow they're still in the playoff race. So really, you didn't miss anything at all. You screwed up royally here because... You could have just kept that episode. I could have just made some points. You could have spliced them into that episode and we could have all got out of here in 20 minutes. Yeah. You know what? If you were the one to open the episode, I wonder how long it would have taken for folks to know that it was just like a remix show. You could do the thing where it's like, yeah, the Red Wings had a very poor game this week against Carolina. (laughs) Except the the one where you insert the players who did poorly, it would just be like the same three players every time. Yeah, we wouldn't have to cover our mouths and do the bit for that, I think. Wow, what a terrible turnover by Alex Dabrinkit. Oh, and Jeff Petrie got walked again, and Reimer let in a stinker. And none of that would be ad-libbed. And somehow the Red Wings gained a point in the standings so, in the like, playoff race today. <laughs> you stop can't... spoiling the, the Carolina, <laughs> de- the details of the Carolina game. You can't help but laugh. Like, this is the most bizarre, we're stealing content from 20 minutes from now, but this whole playoff race is just absolutely bizarro it's a pillow fight it's pathetic it is i can't believe you haven't evan i don't think but brad you and i have talked ourselves into being into the uh, play-in tournament at the end of the season i can't believe that 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 is a poor you're, take now you're it's, watching it right oh now my God. it's horrendous <laughs> Nobody has had to make the argument against it to me for me to change my mind on it. <laughs> Why don't we? Okay, at NHL, here's the thing. Cut the season off now for these wild card race teams in the East and just make them play each other because what's going on right now is pathetic. No, where I'm at is NFL playoffs. Nobody deserves that eight seed right now. Give the one a buy and then just run with yeah, it. Honestly. Well, at least we have the Detroit Tigers to thank for winning three games in the month of March to start the season, and that is the exact same amount of games that the Detroit Red Wings have won in that same month. On that note, welcome to the Wing Creel Podcast, here to talk all things Detroit Red Wings hockey, the world of the NHL, and lots more. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan Hanna. I'm Brad Crisco. And I'm Evan. On this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast, we're going to be covering... The two games that Detroit Red Wings have played, one of them is going to be incredibly quick because it was a terrible game against Carolina, and then yesterday's afternoon game against the Florida Panthers. We are going to be discussing storylines from those games, what the Red Wings did in March, what the playoff race looks like now, how the Red Wings are still somehow in this, and what's upcoming in this final stretch of the season. We're going to be talking about individual players on the Red Wings who are you know pretty hot topics right now, players like Alex Dabrinkit, Jeff Petrie, and others. And then on some more positive news, we're going to be talking about the Grand Rapids Griffins, who, honestly, I joked about the Detroit Tigers, but thank God for the Griffins, really, uh, who have clinched a playoff spot. We're going to be talking about players, the coaching staff, and what this means for the Detroit Red Wings before we get into some news from the NHL and beyond. Before all that, I want to let you know that this podcast is almost entirely supported by our Patreon supporters, patreon.com slash podcast. if you want to support the show and join the so-called Dub Dub Club, as Steve Dangle named it dubbed it back in the day. Oh, I missed an easy trick there. By joining the Dub Dub Club, you get access to some really great benefits like our bonus episodes, which record right after these main ones, which are a blast. You also get access to our Patreon exclusive Discord. Also, we give away two tickets to every Red Wings home game, the vast majority going to our Patreon supporters. You're automatically interested to that giveaway and every other giveaway that we do. So again, patreon.com slash winged wheel podcast. Also, very quickly, if you want a last chance to get these hats that I'm wearing right now, it's the Grand Rapids Griffins Winged Wheel Podcast co-branded hat. Uh, Go to the link in the description and find out how to get your ticket to the Griffins game on April 5th, which includes this co-branded hat. So again, link in the description for that one. So we talked last episode, Evan and I, while you were uh, nearing death, Brad. Again, you survived, fortunately for some, unfortunately for others that the Red Wings' upcoming schedule is a gauntlet. And nothing about what we saw in those two games dispels that notion because Detroit played two games, one against Carolina and one against Florida. And man, those are serious, serious teams. And Detroit has a tall task ahead of them. 
Why don't we start with the Carolina game? 4 nothing loss. Almost a laughable game. Top to bottom, terrible. Carolina's a really good team. They are so <laughs> good, man. They're getting hot at the right time, too. You know how many new Jake Gensel believers there are out there? Like People who just didn't pay attention to the player and thought he was just a product of Crosby? That guy is, what a great fit that is for them. They were playing different sports for most of that game. Yes, that was very much a, this is not the same league that Detroit plays in kind of game. When we sit here in the offseason and we preach and preach and preach to the point everybody gets sick of it about how the Red Wings just need skill, top six skill, top four skill, remember this game. This game was the hallmark for it. You could just see the absolute different levels these teams exist on. 4 nothing. Detroit actually escaped the first period scoreless somehow. And that was about the only thing that they could say was going for them because it's not like the ice was balanced. I think shots were like 15 to 3 or something like that. And it didn't take long for the floodgates to open. Reimer didn't play well. Detroit's usual – top to bottom, Detroit didn't play well. Like I know everyone was on the very obvious mistakes from players like Petrie, but it was the entire team really. Like who on that Red Wings team inspired you that that was a game that they needed to win? Like it looked – you wouldn't have imagined that that was a team that was two points, four points, three points out of a playoff spot with multiple games left to play. I actively lost five pounds that day, and that game did more damage to my health than anything else. And sitting here, I think it might have damaged my memory because as you said that, I actually tried to rack my brain to recall some of the more positive moments so I could like, give a player his flowers for an otherwise awful game. I can't think of a single moment. No, there were actually highlights of the game. Uh, Ken and Mick talking about sunscreen. Yes. Weren't they comforting a young child? Too? Yes. And also, Mickey, yes. <laughs> Mickey Redmond comforting a young, sad Red Wings fan in the crowd. Prashanth paid money to be at that game. Oh, that's oh. <laughs> tough, man. If you're a Carolina fan, then yeah, it's money well spent. Oh, God. And you know what? That was the game where Kane and Zarnik were both out last minute because of illness, which... If, what? if they had what I had, which sounds like they did, <laughs> yeah. I'm I am deeply impressed. Kane only missed one game. Yeah. Well, I, I think when you saw him the next game too, he didn't exactly look a hundred percent. No chance. Whatever's been ripping through that room, whether it's one thing or multiple, like it is taking its toll. I would not be surprised if what you just described, Brad, where you like lost a bunch of water weight really quickly, is exactly what happened to a lot of this team for you know the last month or so. Again, it's not excusing everything. I've actually asked around, and some folks say, yeah, it had an impact, but not to the degree that you've seen. But the amount that the illness has just come up across this team, and it's taking so long to kind of make its way through and then leave them alone, it's tough. Yeah, if it's anything like what I've experienced in my circle of family and friends over the last month, almost all of us have had it. At some point, I imagine it's probably the same thing going through the NHL right now because it's it seems to be very, very prevalent. But that also leads me to believe the Red Wings aren't the only team that are have gotten hit by this. There's no way. Yeah. We, we know how these things work. Everyone gets sick. Everyone gets injured. So you have to factor those things in, of course, but they're not going to be the entire answer in my mind. Anyhow, really, there's not a lot of point in breaking down all of those goals, it was bad. People made a ton of mistakes. Carolina capitalized. It wasn't even one of those games where it was like like Washington, for example, where Detroit actually did relatively well but made mistakes at the worst points and Washington took advantage. No, Carolina dominated, took advantage of mistakes, and Detroit, the effort just wasn't there. Hilariously, the Capitals and the Flyers, the two most important teams, Islanders being the only ones who come close to that, also lost in regulation that night. And you're like, what's going on? As a Red Wings fan, you're you can't describe yourself as happy after watching that game, but you're almost like, can someone put us out of our misery here? Like, if if this feels inevitable, which it's not, spoiler, anything can happen still, but if you feel like it's inevitable, you're like, Washington and F- Philadelphia, do something. Take advantage of this. But all of these teams are just, it's like that gif of the guy falling backwards and sideways and hitting his head down the water slide, but still somehow landing in the pool. Here's the most optimistic view I can have on this stretch because we touched on this a while ago about the Red Wings offseason and what it would look like if they made the playoffs versus if they didn't make the playoffs. And I think to some degree, we all 
came to the conclusion of there needs to be at least a scale back in the sense of a youth movement over the summer, which if they made the playoffs, would they want to risk taking a step back with two or three rookies, maybe even more in the lineup next year? And most teams and most GMs would say, no, once we finally break the drought, we're not going to not hit the gas. And I don't think that's the right play for the Red Wings. But this stretch of hockey has been so inexcusably bad, coupled with the fact that the teams around them have been so inexcusably bad that the Red Wings could still make the playoffs. And this team would have no illusions as to how bad they are. So the offseason could still be, we're horrible and we need to take the approach as such. But we don't have to talk about the playoff drought anymore. We got some playoff experience. Sure, it might be four straight games of six nothing losses to Carolina or Florida, <laughs> but at least they got in. That, you're like I know you're laughing while you're saying that, Brad, but that's actually the reality I subscribe to. Like people have said, and it's been a point made in various places, like they're concerned that if the Red Wings make the playoffs, get tuned up and win at most one game, that it's gonna give people delusions of grandeur and and Eiserman's going to do things the wrong way and it's like no obviously Eisman can see how bad this is they just set a bottom eight worst month that they've had in the last 35 years as a franchise no one thinks what just happened in March and it's a small miracle and a little bit also to their own credit for the winning streaks from January and February that they're even still in this race you run a simulation where Detroit plays to this level a hundred times maybe three or four universes they're still in this position and we just happen to be in that one because washington florida the islanders and everyone else just completely fell apart at the exact time detroit needed them to if they play at their march pace across the entire season we're the favorites for macklin celebrini right now if that's how bad it was if they played at their march pace across the entire season i think the nhl might pluck bedard out of chicago and give him to detroit out of pity please that would be nice (laughs) yeah actually you know let's not Let's not put in too much hope there. All right, let's jump into a game where they actually did get a point. The Florida Panthers game where Detroit was in Florida on a Saturday afternoon. Again, in the middle of this road trip, they have one more game after it in Tampa Bay on Monday night. But that Florida game was never going to be easy. You're going from Carolina to Florida. You're going from cup contender to cup contender. And Florida very obviously has just recently tuned up Detroit at Winged Wheel Podcast Day, which was quite rude. So... If you could walk away with anything here, I think you're happy if you're the Red Wings. That's not really the feeling the fan base had after the game, but Detroit walked away with a point and they were actually leading going into the third period, which is quite notable. Alex Lyon in net for this one, he, I think, had a really great performance. I don't really fault him for either of the goals. I think he has teammates to thank for that one. Sider had a hell of a redirect in on Barkov's second goal, and Debrinket had a shocker of a game where he was, you know, the puck was pulled off of him and just not really doing anything on coverage, coming back, et cetera. But Detroit got a point out of this one, needed some Larkin heroics. All in all, was it ugly? Yes. Did it leave people feeling pissed off? Yes. Did it keep them in the race? Based on the teams around them doing absolutely nothing? Yes. Detroit got one point and gained ground. That's horrifying. I know I mentioned it before the episode, and I want to repeat it on the episode. The Carolina game, I was pissed at the players and the coaching. Because it was a horrible effort, horrible systems. At no point were they ever in that game. At no point did they ever look like they gave a crap to be in that game. The Florida game, I was mad at Iserman because that was a team that you could tell the effort level picked up a little bit. Mm -hmm. But the roster was just so outmatched where they got into this cycle. And I remember Mickey making fun of it a little bit in the second period. Where Florida would get the puck into Detroit zone. Detroit would scramble, somehow get possession of the puck, look up, nothing's available. Flip it in the air to the far blue line. Florida would gather it, regroup, regroup, regroup. The first couple of times I, I was getting mad and I'm, can you try something? And then the more it happened and the more I watched variations of this, I realized that's all they can do. It's not that they want to do that. That's all they can do. They don't have the horses. They don't have the skill to keep up with Florida. So it really turned into a game of just holding them off and praying for a mistake, praying for some power plays praying for some goaltending and going into the third period. It worked. It was bad. It was ugly. The Red Wings got exposed. 
It was a bad roster. And when I say I'm mad at Eisenman, I don't, not literally, like, it wasn't a Lalonde players problem that game is what I'm saying. They were two, They were up against a team that was just yeah. constructed way better than them. Exactly. It was a bad roster up against a good roster, and they were doing everything they can to hold on. They weren't perfect. A lot of players, like you said, had bad games. You highlighted some of the more notable ones. And, yeah, I'm mad about the game because it was awful, but not for a lot of reasons the team could control. The game had pretty much the worst start you could possibly think of. Like, if you're one of the script writers for the – the hockey world. This one was a bit on the nose. Jeff Petrie shot a puck and Jeff Petrie is enemy number one in the Red Wings fan base right now. Probably a bit too much. Like too many things are attributed to Jeff Petrie. They were, were falling an inch short of he burned my crops and, you know, kidnapped my family. Jeff Petrie's had an awful season. Uh, there's no doubt about that. He plays way too many minutes for the quality player he is, but this shot wasn't his fault. He was coming across the blue line, took a slap shot. It was actually the the right play for one of the few things that Jeff Petrie can do well from time to time for the Red Wings is offensive acumen. He was walking the blue line, shot the puck. It was on target. It took a deflection outward. And Dylan Larkin was, I think he was battling with a player in front and just turned at the wrong point. And the puck hit right above his shin pad right as his knee was flexing, so I guess there wasn't any coverage in that spot. It must have hit the tip of a bone or something. And Larkin was hurt in a bad way, like under 30 seconds into the game. And you're just like, here we go again. Come on, man. That was just so on the nose. And he looked hurt, hurt. He left. He actually came back on the bench. You're like, oh, my God. Again, the the story as it always goes with Larkin is he always leaves and comes back or he battles through it or he plays injured somewhat. And then he tried to take a face off and he had to leave again. And I was like, oh, no, that's it. He's done for the season. And then he came back again. Very apt for this weekend. (laughs) Wow, I can't believe it. I hope everyone had a great Easter weekend, by the way. (laughs) But that was Larkin. He he. Wasn't playing at 100% for the rest of the game, and I'd be surprised if he was 100% for the rest of the season either. But yeah, came back, actually scored the tying goal. But before that, uh, Robbie Fabry scored on the power play, which impressive because Florida's penalty kill is overwhelming. I felt suffocated watching that. And that's the same thing we talked about earlier in March. But Robbie Fabry scored on the power play from Perron and Goss' bear. Detroit got through the second period, still up one nothing, And again, you can see the direction the ice was tilting in but they got through they were what 16 1 and 1 something like that with a lead through 40 and so you felt okay but it's the florida panthers and you can see the way the game was going line was making big saves but the first bark off goal came off the rush it was ekblad on side or one-on-one the puck eventually got through to brink it really misses the assignment i think on bark off it was him and cop around him as bark off banked it in and the other goal was Barkov as well, and Barkov walked Petrie coming in, and Mo Sider trying to deflect the puck away. I don't know. It was just a beautiful redirect in past Lyon. Like, Lyon didn't have a chance. Pretty unfortunate for Alex Lyon. Yeah. I don't know. Lyon did what you could ask him to do against the Florida Panthers that game. Yeah, he had to make some absolutely massive stops to keep the Red Wings even remotely in this game. So if you're going to hang your hat on the reason why the Red Wings lost, he would be the furthest from it. And then on the power play with under five minutes to go, it was a four-on-three power play, actually. Detroit miraculously was able to tie the game and steal a point as Patrick Kane from the top of the circles found Larkin, who snuck to the right side of the net, fired at home. And I honestly believe like if the Red Wings managed to do this somehow, and I'm not going to pretend to be able to see the future because what's even happening in this playoff race but if they manage to do it, you have to point at that moment and say, had Larkin left the game and not played through the pain, I don't know that they make it. Like He stole them a point in that moment. I feel like we've had so many of these moments. Patrick Kane's had to be the savior sometimes. Yeah. yeah. Patrick Kane had the big moment in Chicago. Detroit losing streak followed very shortly after. We thought Raymond's tying goal against Columbus would get them out of the funk. We were wrong. Larkin scoring here to get a point against the top team. Could that be the one that snaps him out of the funk? I hope so. But if history has taught us anything, I'm not optimistic. It's not even like we'll talk about it in a minute here, but it's not even about 
the how anymore. It's literally just about the results. Like it's, you have very few games left. You just have to hashtag just win, but not in the fun way that we were saying it before. You just have to find a way to get these dirty, ugly points. And that's what they did. The game went to overtime. Nothing happened. It went to the shootout. The only goal was Reinhardt's goal in the first shot. Raymond, Kane, and Larkin weren't able to beat Bobrovsky. And that was it. Florida won 3-2 in a shootout. Detroit got a point. I'll take that point all day. Yeah, it's If you would have told me that they got a point against Florida after the last episode, I'd be like, okay, good. I'll take that. It's ugly. It feels gross after watching that game. You're like, they had the lead. You know, you had that Debrinket almost finished it in, in overtime after hitting the post, and he had his missed assignments. The, there was a shift where Jeff Petrie had, like, it, it was like a, a Benny Hill skit. Like two turnovers, and there was a turnover on the sidewall, and everyone was just all over the place, and what people it, were missing their assignments. The best quote about that play, it's like you're trying to run from something in your dream, and just nothing's working <laughs> or moving. And that was that was Petrie on that one play with the turnover. And then he just fell randomly. And then it ended in a Debrinket breakaway, which <laughs> Bobrovsky's stopped as well. Hockey's weird, man. Yeah, it is. And that's that's the, the takeaway from this, is like that was a game that Probably wasn't great all in all, and the players are unhappy, but they got a point and they gained ground because everyone else around them sucks. Florida, we talked about this last episode where Detroit played for it as well earlier in March, but Florida is such a annoying team to play against. Like Ekblad grabbed someone in a headlock after every single whistle, it felt like. And I understand that the refs are going to let a lot go, and I'm not saying anytime there's a scrum after the whistle call a penalty. I like a lot of edge to a game. I like when a game gets chippy. It's good playoff atmosphere, and that's what Florida's gearing up for. But as a referee, at some point, you have to decide, am I going to let that guy grab someone in a headlock after every whistle or not? Because if you are going to let him do that, inevitably, 99 times out of 100, it's going to turn into a scrum or a fight or whatever, and then you're going to have to make a choice, okay, well, am I going to call it offsetting, or am I going to factor in that this guy has been instigating that all the game? What happens in the NHL, because I think the refs are cowards, is that they'll call it offsetting. Essentially, what you're doing is letting Ekblad get away with that. But that's like, I don't know. To me, that was so annoying to watch. Are you new here? Yes. You must be. Yeah. Because this is a tale as old as time. And you alluded it to a little bit where they'll just call offsetting. If you want a ref to be a deterrent to situations like that, uh, they never have been and they never will be. And that's what makes, and we talked about it. That's what makes them effective, yeah. Yeah, this is what we talked about after the Winged Wheel podcast night. This is why Florida is maybe the best of the best in the NHL. There's a lot of good teams and a lot of teams who can go pound for pound skill-wise with the Panthers, but very, very few of them have this, you know, prick factor to them that the Panthers have so effectively. The Panthers right now are doing their best to be the 2011 to 2023 Boston Bruins, and they're doing a real good job of it. Yeah, they are the new era of that. And you know what? They learned a lot from Tampa Bay, too, because Tampa Bay is a team where people don't really think about it because they just think about like the Kucherov and the Art Ross race and point, you know, getting a ton of points from being drafted after the first round, that kind of thing. But that's a team where any one of those guys will cross check you in the ribs or jump you after a whistle. So they don't of, even force it. Like that's just who they are as players. Like that is yeah. their team's MO and that's what those players like to do. So that's their ethos. Man, they get they get fans and they get play other teams off their game fast. Yeah. I I thought Detroit did a good job managing it too. You know what I also saw was Peron almost started it a lot of times. Like he would throw a shoulder, he would interfere with someone, he would, you know, pretty much try to pile drive someone after the whistle or something. And sometimes he was trying to get back at them. And sometimes it was just, he was getting, he was starting it before they could. And I like that. If you're not going to be effective in other ways, or even if you are effective in other ways, you know that that's a game that they're going to bring to you. Try to throw them off, fight fire with fire, but don't do it in a retaliatory way because that's when you get dinged. So that actually made sense to me. I think that's part of why Detroit was able to hang in it a little bit. So that was Detroit's two games. They took one of four points and they somehow gained ground in the playoff race or at least didn't lose any appreciable ground. This podcast feels so weird right now. This is just like the weirdest energy around a playoff race. I think that's happened in the NHL in a long time. Here's the update on the standings as of Sunday evening at 8 p.m. Detroit is the first team outside of the wild card 
spots. So the two wildcard spots are Tampa Bay and Philly. Philadelphia Flyers have 82 points, 75 games played. They have seven games remaining. Detroit has 80 points with 74 games played, so they have eight games remaining. The Washington Capitals have pushed Philly out of the third divisional seat in the Metro. Washington has 82 points in 73 games played. They have nine games remaining. Behind Detroit are the New York Islanders. They have 77 points with nine games remaining. They've played 73 games. So the Islanders have a game in hand on the Red Wings, but they can't pass them with that game in hand. Detroit has a game in hand on Philadelphia, and they can only tie them in points with that game in hand. But Philadelphia would still technically hold the wild card spot in that hypothetical because they hold the first tiebreaker, which is 28 regulation wins versus Detroit's 25. Detroit just had one of the worst months in a long, long time. And based on expectations compared to how they were playing the rest of the season, probably the worst month they've had since we started this podcast over the past nine years, I'd say. Because anytime they've had a month as bad as that, they weren't expected to be good. And they are still two points of the game in hand outside of a playoff spot. What the hell? <laughs> this playoff race is like the tortoise and the hare, except the hare is dead. <laughs> and the tortoise is also dead. <laughs> and all the spectators are dead as well. That's what this is. There was a point during the Carolina game where my friends were over. They wanted to watch. They're like, hey, can we come watch the game at your place? I'm like, yeah, but you know I cover the games, right? Like, it's not going to be fun for you. Like, you're just going to be watching the game with each other while I'm covering it. They're like, yeah, we like to watch your misery. And after it was 2 nothing Carolina, my friend turned to me and said, because our kegerator wasn't tapped, he was like, I can't believe you're making me watch this game sober. And that's what it feels like with this entire playoff race. Like, it feels, actually, it feels like I'm wasted watching it. It feels like the teams are wasted trying to play for it. It's hard to have this energy. Like, it almost feels like it's contrived, but I promise you it's not. The reality is Detroit is in this still somehow by a miracle from the hockey gods, and all it takes is one or two nights of good results, and Detroit is back in a playoff spot. I know eight games isn't that many, but when you're talking two points, maybe zero points if you are if you win that game in hand, this whole order could shift four more times. The the Red Wings' most likely scenario to get into a playoff spot here is the Flyers just lose every game they have remaining and somehow the Red Wings end up with a tiebreaker on an overtime loss or they get just enough points on overtime losses yeah. to Buffalo and Montreal. That's it. Like If you just squeeze out the ugliest points of the season, it might be enough. It could be a bunch of actual losses like the Florida game and it could be enough. If the Red Wings only lo- have overtime losses the rest of the way, that's an improvement on how they've been playing. That probably legitimately <laughs> gets them in the playoffs. The <laughs> I know. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. What's the number? Like, what, 91, 92 points maybe? If that. It seems like the floor keeps sinking. <laughs> the, the one thing that's going to make this fascinating to me is uh, I looked at everybody's remaining schedule. Uh, Philadelphia has the murderer's row of lottery teams left on their schedule. I think the Red Wings have two or another two or three top teams, but then they get a lot of lottery teams towards the end of the season. I think there's uh, Buffalo. Their last two games of the season are Montreal. Like there is opportunity here, and I've seen the track record the Red Wings have had playing lottery teams lately. Th- that's I don't my care point. Strike the schedule. No, it no, that's mean anything. But it's my point from entertainment value. How? Did we end up in a position where Montreal and Columbus and Buffalo are going to hold so much influence and they're going to shape it and mold it, not by losing as expected, but because there's going to be so many unexpected wins that this is just going to get thrown into chaos. Detroit plays Tampa Bay on Monday night, 7 p.m. Eastern on the road. That's the, the Islanders play play Philly. Yep, the Islanders play Philly. <sighs> By zero, next, zero all the way to a shootout. Detroit I, can lose against the other wildcard team in regulation, and our next episode might be the same message of somehow they're still in this. I totally want to say the picture should be more clear by next episode. No. But every time we come back after a couple games, I'm like, <laughs> I cannot believe we're saying the same things again. It's like a Jackson Pollock painting. It it's, all... It just keeps... We reset the counter every single time we sit down in these chairs. This is why I qualified 
all of our previous conversations of like this game feels like must win but isn't mathematically must win. Detroit could come off a March that had them winning and Prashanth pulled this up. I should give him credit. Their points percentage in March was a 28.6% of the possible points. Oh my God. So yeah, losing out in overtime would actually double their points. They're, <laughs> they are coming off a March where that was their points percentage. Could lose more. You're a lottery team at that point percentage. And they could still get into the playoffs. All it takes is they're getting close to like you have to win or your season's dead point. Like where so are the teams they're competing with. No one's pulled away. <laughs> they're all they're doing is making just enough progress to keep in lockstep with Detroit. So I mean, you you talk about the episode just to to acknowledge the egg on our face. The episode that Evan makes fun of a lot, the one where he wasn't there because he was sick and it was Brad and I and we for the first time in nine years, we're so optimistic. We said, like, we think this is a playoff team unless, like, the impossible happens or they completely catastrophically collapse. 28.6% in the month of March is a catastrophic collapse. That's a choke job for all time. If you ended the season right there, it'd be a big enough storyline where we're probably talking about that for the duration of the summer. But... That might not even be the last storyline of the season. We could have a storyline where Detroit wins 28% of their possible points in the month of March and then still makes the playoffs after that. That's bizarro land. Just for a fun stat, what was Detroit's exact points percentage in March again? 28.6, I think, if you round. 28.6. The San Jose Sharks point percentage for the season, (laughs) 28.7. Wow. (laughs) Wow. Oh man, that's so bad. They would literally be in dead last in the NHL. What if it turns out this was all just the flu? Like it was literally just Larkin hurt, goalies cold, and the team had the flu, and all of a sudden they're back to being a 600 team. If all those warning signs weren't there, even when they were hot in January and February, I'd say maybe. Yeah. That's the optimistic view, but they weren't this bad, but you could tell they were riding a shooting percentage goalie save percentage, you know, a PDO bender a little bit. So we knew some regression was likely. We didn't think this. This is four this times is the regression. Yeah. This is not regression. It's a pendulum. <laughs> yeah. That's uh, that's one of the scientists that controls a simulation, looked at a knob and went, oh, who cranked that to 10? It went all the way down to one for a while. So we got to cool that off. Upcoming Detroit has, again, Monday night, Tampa Bay. Oof. Three nights off, and then at home, three games, they have the New York Rangers. (laughs) No. (laughs) Who have already clinched their playoff spot. The Buffalo Sabres. Hey, that was one of the three wins in March. The Washington Capitals. And that, the last game against the Capitals was the biggest game of the season. This one might not be if if Washington pulls away, but why do I have the feeling that Washington isn't going to pull away and they're going to be right in the mix with Philly? So that could, again, be the biggest game of the season. They then have Pittsburgh on the road, Toronto on the road, and then to end the season, they have a home-and-home, home, so in Detroit and then in Montreal on consecutive days, Montreal in Montreal. I don't care about strength of schedule because the Red Wings lost to Arizona twice in a week in an embarrassing fashion. You should have to have some sort of strength yourself. <laughs> You, you there, can't you can't have a benchmark when you're 0.28 points percentage. The only strength remaining in Detroit's schedule is that they have one more game left than the Philadelphia Flyers. It, yes. I feel, you know, when you, you pull an all-nighter when you're a kid and it's like hour 29 and you're trying to make it through the next day and you're a little delirious? That's how I feel covering this team right now. Oh, yeah. On that note, why don't we take a break? We'll be back with you in a moment. But first, we want to let you know that this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast is proudly brought to you by Labatt Blue Light. Created in 1983, this premium light Canadian Pilsner is a delicately balanced beer brewed with Cascade hops and a blend of malt. It's fresh, crisp, and brewed to the highest quality standards. There's a little bit of Canadian kindness in every sip of Labatt Blue Light. How did it get in there? They're Canadian. That's how. You can spread the love yourself by sharing a Labatt. And when you do share a Labatt, you're not just sharing a beer. You're sharing an experience that'll pair with anything from hockey to a hoedown. So next time you're watching a hockey with your buds, be sure to share a Labatt because while you might not all root for the same team, although we on this podcast do hope you're rooting for the Red Wings, you can all enjoy a Labatt Blue Light. We honestly love going to games in Detroit and seeing Labatt being the beer that fans clamor for all over the arena. It's a reliable beer and great to have in your hand when celebrating a goal. 
So head to the link in the description of this episode or the one you see on your screen to find Labatt in stores near you today. You must be 21 or older, and as always, enjoy responsibly. All right, and welcome back to No One Wants This Playoff Spot. More on the Red Wings, outside of, you know, nobody wanting to take that second wildcard spot. But individual storylines on the Red Wings, there are a couple of them. We were talking before the episode, and I was talking a lot about Debrinket and Brad, you were talking about Petrie. So why don't we start with, with Petrie, because obviously that's been the hot topic. That's been the the channel through which most Red Wings fans have been placing their anger, justified or not. Why don't we discuss that one? Because it's not been good. Evan, last episode you said very obviously this is a guy whose confidence is shaken and because there's no one else, as you mentioned, Brad, on the roster really that Eisenman put in that position, Petrie has had to be played way more than he should be. It's been a rough go. Yeah, this is turned into the most contentious online debate amongst Red Wings fans all season. And as always, the nuance and the middle ground has been completely missed. Inference is dead. Nuance is dead. Does not exist. Yes. Is Jeff Petrie the worst player on the Detroit Red Wings? Yeah, probably. Is he the reason for all of their defensive troubles? No, not even close to it. I think he's obviously the scapegoat, fairly or unfairly. If you think he's the only one with a lot of the issues he has, I have some bad news for you. (laughs) He is almost as bad as advertised. Should he be a second pairing D? Absolutely not. Should he be a third pairing D? Probably not. I think I'd rather try Justin Holt at this point, if I'm being honest. But but understanding, that's probably not much of an upgrade at best. It is what it is, and there's, you know, good on the loan for getting ahead of it in some situations, like I think it was Carolina's first or second goal, where Petrie and Rasmussen were responsible for what ended up being an easy backdoor tap-in for the Mm -hmm. Hurricanes, and the loan said, no, in our system, Rasmussen's supposed to chase there, and there was a lot of discourse around that, to which I understand what Lalone's trying to do there. But if someone on your team blows his assignment, which Rasmussen very much did there, so he is primarily at fault, you cover the highest danger opponent, which would have been the backdoor tap in there. And Petrie was pointing at Rasmussen to go. So he recognized it. Rasmussen did not go. Petrie wanted to make the right play there. So good on him for recognizing it. And he was actually in the right position. Yeah, everything to that point was good. But as soon as he realized Rasmussen wasn't letting off his chase, he he had to make the switch and go over there. And he didn't. And then him and Rasmussen went to the guy who ultimately ended up with the puck and turned it into a two-on-one. And somehow neither of them got the puck. And then it ended up (laughs) over in a backdoor tap-in. And it's stuff like that that adds up. We talked about the comedy of errors he had on that one shift in Florida and another goal in Carolina where it was just a backdoor tap-in. Again, guy coming out from behind his net. Petrie at no point, shoulder checks, half-heartedly swings at a puck. It's another goal for Carolina. It is okay to say he is bad as he is, and you would be correct, but it is not okay to say He is the be-all, end-all of Detroit's defensive troubles because right now everyone below Sider is a problem. Their next best defenseman currently might be Edvinson, and he's he's still making a ton of rookie mistakes, so that's not really saying all that much. Jake Wallman is, I think, close to returning. He still has to be cleared, and they feel it without him right now. And that is a big statement because Wallman wasn't exactly doing great before he was out because I think he was playing banged up and he wasn't on one of his highs of the season. He's an important defenseman for the Red Wings, even though he's not like an upper echelon first pair D man, just because he makes that top pairing serviceable or that, you know, Detroit's top four serviceable. Someone tweeted at me and said, I'm starting to realize more and more of what you guys have been saying, which is that any given game, the Red Wings have like two and a half to three and a half defensemen. It's like, yeah, yeah. They have, like, if not for Sherratt having a much better season this year relative to last season, they might not have had a defense that would have been sufficient for them even to have a a win streak because of a run hot by their goalie in their offense. 
when we talk about, you know, Petrie time and time again, even though he's been awful all season, it's not because you expect anything to change. You said something in there, Brad, that I completely agree with. This is what it is. It is what it is for the rest of these eight games. And if they make the playoffs, it is what it is for that playoff run, even if it's only four games. That's not changing. You know, it, if you're expecting anything different from this team in terms of deployment or performance from these players, you're going to drive yourself insane because this is all they can do. And this is really all alone can do in terms of deployment. I would like to see a little less from Petrie, but I guarantee that'll happen once Wallman comes back. This to me, the reason we talk about it so much is because the pro scouting aspect of management and the the kind of moves that Eisenman needs to make if he wants his team to advance, even if he brings up young players on their ELCs, the defense and what he has to change on defense is crucial. Crucial. Last season was a it was a gaff. Like Hall and Petrie coming in. You want you expected it to be not this bad from Petrie, and it just hasn't turned out for Hall, and the contract was bad. Like but you can't make that mistake again, and now you have to have some undoing. If you want to talk about next season, you have to undo those mistakes. And that's why the anger on the fan base is directed towards defense and probably disproportionately to like one guy to the point where they're saying, like, you know, bench Petrie after that shot that hit Larkin, even though that was just a deflection. Team defense has dropped off since January, February. But yeah, the, this, this defense is constructed in such a way where they're going to be awful like this. Has it that much, though, is my question because... Well, that leads into my next point. Yeah, because what is a pedio bender, which is what we kind of called January and February a lot. And I think we underestimated just how much of a bender it was. It's shooting percentage and safe percentage. Not anything the defense was doing dramatically different. The Red Wings were getting the puck past the goalie more than league average suggested they should. And their goaltenders were saving the puck at a higher percentage than league average said they should. So they were just outscoring and out saving their defensive problems that have always been there. Yeah, I, I tweeted out something similar. Like you can be mad at the defense all you want, but they, they've been this bad in and around all season. They were just covering for it better. And I don't mean they got lucky. Like I know PDO implies luck and is, I mean, depending on how you interpret it, is luck. But to me, I, I don't really, I'm not on that path full on. I, I think they had a design to how they have to win their games based on how the roster is constructed. And I think they were doing that in a lot of January and February. Well, it's amazing how much different it looks relative to this point we're making. If your offense is running hot, well, what does that mean? Uh, It means the puck's in the offensive zone a lot more, which means your defense isn't getting exposed as much. And when it comes down the other way and your goalies are stopping most of the pucks, well, are we sitting here, any of us on Twitter and highlighting breakdowns of defensive miscues that end up in the goalie's catcher? No. No, we don't until it ends up in the back of the net. So it's been there. It's just getting more stressed now because of the ramped up defensive zone time. And it's getting highlighted because a lot of these pucks that weren't going into the back of the net are. Another player I want to talk about, and I mentioned, I think a couple episodes ago that if Detroit's going to turn this around, I think they have to get Debrinket going. And Debrinket seems like a player not dissimilar to Petrie to me, where his confidence just isn't there right now. You can see his frustration with the puck not going in. He's shooting the puck to different spots because I think he's in his own head about missing the net as much as he has been. The turnovers and the liability down the ice, which I, I don't think he's a stalwart defensive player, but it's been bad recently. Like it's been noticeable. Like he has been feast or famine. Very little in between and a lot more famine than you'd like with Alex Dabrinkit. If you're going to be playing with Patrick Kane too, like Patrick Kane is a game breaker with the puck on his stick. He that He's the one who made the pass to Larkin. It was a really smart play where he was drawing the play away from Larkin to buy him the space to sneak into that spot on the tying goal against Florida. That's what Patrick Kane brings you. The showtime moments like the OT goal against Chicago. Patrick Kane, I don't know that he's won a board battle or even tried a board battle since he got to Detroit. And even when he gets his strength to 100% as he rebuilds the musculature that he lost in and around his hips, he's just not going to be that kind of player. So that's the trade-off with Kane at this age. You can't be having that with Debrinket on his line. There's a conversation maybe for a later date about what Detroit should be doing in terms of their line combinations and overloading that, that top line. But 
if Detroit's going to do this, it, I think Debrinket has to figure this out because it's not been a good run for him. It's a shooter with no confidence. And you can see the amount of times he double clutches the puck, looks off a shot, holds it for too long before letting it go. And that's not a recipe to score goals in no. any league. It, it's all about speed and accuracy. And, you know, I, in the middle of a playoff race probably isn't the time to be experimenting with stuff. But if I'm Lalonde, especially on the power play, you know, to steal a line from Alex Ovechkin here, don't think, babe, just shoot. Yeah, that that's all you got to get to bring. Let's be honest. There is not enough shooting talent or offensive talent in general around him that you need to worry about taking shots away from elsewhere on the ice. Hell, even Patrick Kane, he, he can't shoot. He's not an outside shooting threat. Oh, he's, oh, oh, that's Patrick Kane with two slap shot goals this season. That's from right. the slot. So if he, <laughs> no, one of them was from the point. Okay. He should not have gone in, but fair <laughs> enough. But if he, if he, if Patrick Kane finds himself wide open in the slot. Okay. But every time that puck comes to the brinket and there's even a chance he's able to get that shot through, fire it. Don't even think aim center mass. If you miss by a little bit, maybe it goes in because it's hockey. Eventually, something's going to hit a stick. Something's going to hit a knee. Goalie's going to whiff on something and something's going to drop for him. And we've seen how streaky he is when he gets his confidence. This team can't score or generate offense for garbage right now. So if you can get him rolling, that should maybe be the priority. Just shoot until something falls and then hope that is the confidence boost he needs to launch into another one of the streaks like he's had a few of this year. Johan Franz and shades of like, honestly, yeah, if Detroit's going to do this, like I, I, it's not going to be pretty. It's going to be a blue collar lunch pail effort through the rest of the season. It's going to be a lot of ugly, mucky days and you're going to have to grind for your goals and you're not going to end up as ESPN's highlight of the night. But if you get one or two points, better than you've been doing so that's probably all we can do on the detroit red wings this episode why don't we jump into a happier note which is the west side of michigan the grand rapids griffins after starting the season you know really kind of feeling the game out a lot of new players a new coaching staff trying to understand how to regain the form of the griffins of old they've now clinched a playoff spot dan watson has turned this team around sebastian cosa is really probably the biggest name right now throughout that process is on a franchise record 17 game streak where when he's playing the Griffins get a point he's 11 0 and 6 in that stretch he has not lost a game in regulation since January 12th against Rockford the Griffins are headed back to the AHL playoffs what a huge story for the Red Wings organization it's massive for the Griffins in in the city of Grand Rapids and that entire team and their fan base but if you're an organization who's rebuilding and you have a prospect pool as good as what Scott Wheeler told us last episode, this is the result you want, and that's a great sign. It's a great sign for what's coming down the road. It's a very young AHL team, which is a good sign for the future that they've shown they can win at any professional level, honestly, because, you know, Casper and Edvinson and Johansson and Soderblom and Lombardi and Kosa, they're not and Mazer, they're not bit pieces on this team. They're features. Mm -hmm. They're scoring key goals. They are playing big minutes. They are playing both special teams in some cases. And obviously with Kosa now being the clear starting goaltender, that's not nothing. That is hugely, hugely important because they're going to play a lot of very key, very critical games against good teams down the stretch here, which is going to ease the transition into the NHL when it gets ramped up a notch. Yeah, if if... These guys were piling up points and playing big minutes against all the bottom feeders in the NHL. Great for their confidence, but it's not going to help translate it. The fact that they're having success against good teams and the fact that they're going to get playoff experience and heck, they might win a round or two. That's going to go a long, long way in their development. I like that you named all those players, Brad, because it really speaks to how many options the Red Wings have. And I mean, none of them are going to come up and be Connor Bedard. So when people are like, oh, but we don't have a game breaker, that's true. And, you know, we talk a lot about what the Red Wings need in terms of a, a high-end offensive player. But still, you know, when you get the question of which Red Wings forward is most likely to make this team next year on an ELC, I actually can't say for sure whether it's Marco Casper or Carter Mazur or someone else. If you say 
is Detroit going to have just Edvinson next year or is it going to be Edvinson and Johansson? It could be Edvinson and Johansson and two guys on an ELC. That could be a big move. Like you could see multiple and don't get your hopes up like four or five guys on an ELC in one season is is very, very unlikely, especially with how the Red Wings do things. But that's the kind of talent that they have down there. Also, like what have we said time and time again with these Red Wings? You have to break out of the mentality and the culture of losing. And it stunk around Hockey Town for a long time because the roster was bad and it losing begets losing and it players don't know how to compete and players you I mean they're still coming out of it because teams who are good teams who are perennial playoff teams don't collapse late in the season like the Red Wings have. So they're still learning from this. And so if you have the next generation of players already learning how to win and how to build that culture and mindset now, like that's all you can ask for from your AHL team. One of the impressive parts of this little streak that the Griffins have been on is they're doing it without Edvinson too, who is yeah. a massive piece to the the recent success of this team. So, you know, whether he ends up going back down for the playoff run or staying up with Detroit is very TBD and it all depends on what the, when Wallman comes back. But yeah, Grand Rapids is having a great season. And like you said, it was a slow start for them. Everybody trying to figure it out, but everything's turned around and a lot of the important guys for the Red Wings going forward are playing key contributing parts to that team. Some other things I think are good, and this won't be a popular conversation, but whatever's going to happen with Jonathan Berggren, you know, provided he stays healthy here, it is good for him to at least be part of such a big time winning demonstration in the AHL because if the Red Wings don't give him a, an NHL roster spot, that's inherently going to make it a little bit harder to move him in the offseason. But then you can make the case of, yeah, he couldn't make our NHL team, but look what he's doing in the AHL. Like This guy runs the show. Very obviously, he's too good for this. And so for him to still be the highlight of that and contributing points and scoring goals, that's massive. Additionally, Sebastian Cosa, obviously, if you could pick all the eventualities in terms of what could the season be for him where you're happy as a Red Wings fan in his development, this is top of the list of what's realistic. Like, this is exactly what you want to see from Kosa. We've talked about that quite a bit. The question that comes from that from a lot of people, especially as Red Wings goaltenders have struggled lately, is what's his timeline? Is it next season? My intuition on that one is that you know maybe he gets some games next season depending on what their lineup looks like, but really... I think even an optimistic view is another year in Grand Rapids as the starter, and then the year after that is when you start to really give him the opportunity to challenge for that spot. He could earn it out of camp for sure, just like any other position, but with goalies, you need to give him a lot of runway. Well, it's interesting, and circling back to the origin of this conversation, the reason the playoffs might be so important for no other reason would, would be to see how Kosa handles it. If uh, he comes in here as a uh, basically first year starter in the AHL and has a huge playoffs when the pressure's at its tippy top and guys are going to be running him and he's going to be getting, you know, more shots, more rebounds, tougher quality of shot, more battles in front of him. If he holds up to that, that's a, again, a good sign to transition to the NHL. I still don't think that means he's on the Red Wings next year. But it's it's a good first step where you can maybe say, all right, we might be able to shorten up the timeline a little bit here because he can handle big moments. Honestly, I think the likely scenario here is he continues his run hot through the regular season, probably performs adequately in the playoffs, but I, I wouldn't expect him to light it up as a first-time starter in the playoffs behind a young team. And then he comes back next year as a full-time starter, gets a full year, hopefully has another great year gets into the playoffs again, is a little more comfortable and familiar with the situation and improves there. And then we're talking about, all right, is he ready for the Red Wings? In any case, thank you to the Grand Rapids Griffins for giving us positive hockey to talk about in Michigan. Hopefully the Red Wings turn it around and it's, you know, April in the D again, but until then. All right, let's jump into some NHL news. Austin Matthews hit 60 goals. Ninth player in NHL history with two or more 60-goal seasons. He is joining Mike Bossy with five, who is tied with Wayne Gretzky, also has five at the top of the list. Phil Esposito has four 60-goal seasons. Mario Lemieux has four. Brett Hull has three. Pavel Berry has two. Yari Curry has two. And our, our very own Steve Eisman has two. And that's it. Austin Matthews also, like, he was stuck at 59 for a little bit. And at points, people are like, oh, he's slumping, blah, blah, blah. I still think, even with Alex Ovechkin chasing Wayne Gretzky for his goals record, 
it is not impossible to think that Austin Matthews might still go down as one of the greatest goal scorers of all time or challenging Ovechkin for that that mantle. There are a lot of Stanley Cups on that list that you mentioned. Just, a, just gonna throw that out there. A lot of Stanley Cups on that yeah, list. Yeah, weird. I think someone was pointing out that his pace isn't that dissimilar to Ovechkin's. So if he has the health and the longevity of Ovechkin, it could be within striking distance. Now, we've heard the joke forever about Ovechkin, Russian machine never break. Yeah. So it's going to take a lot for a uh, lot of things to go right for Matthews to get there and have the longevity and still be scoring, you know, what's Ovechkin now, 38, 39 years old? 38 years old, And yeah. he might hit 30 goals this year. Like, that's nuts and it's probably a lot to ask austin matthews to do that but it's possible ovechkin has the luxury of just playing winger too and kind of just you know working part-time hours out there for the most part where austin matthews is playing center and eating a lot of big minutes and having to play 200 foot hockey so the fact that he's hit 60 twice in his career now is beyond impressive you know we talk a lot about mcdavid and how he's come back this season and how he started off poorly and is now on the brink of potentially, he's within two points of the NHL lead in points. For a few minutes, he was tied for first. Yeah. Austin Matthews has done that a few times too, where he started a season slow or, you know, coming back from wrist injury or whatever, and he just scores enough goals where all of a sudden you're like, wow, he has 50 goals and there's still X number of games left. What the hell? The longevity is hard. The best ability is availability, and it's really hard to do that for 20 seasons. You're talking about having wrist injuries already. I don't think he eats nearly as much Subway and Flamin' Hot Cheetos, so he doesn't have Definitely that in his not. favor. But uh, if he can do it, then I think he's going to be in that race. Scoring is going back up in the NHL, but it's still not at the heights of what it was back in the day. So if Don't you, see anybody else score multiple 60-goal seasons. No, and if you do some era adjustments, I'm sure Matthews is already really far up that list. The Art Ross race. Nathan McKinnon, 127. Nikita Kucherov, 126. Connor McDavid, 125. This was, is exciting, man. There was, what, a 15-minute stretch on Saturday night where they all had 125? It's That's, nuts. That is insane. There's a, a stat going around, and I knew it was a lot because McDavid started slow because he got hurt and then he was playing hurt. You could see it on him. But in the last 59 games, he has 115 points. <laughs> That's almost two points per game for most of a season. This is why I said a few episodes ago, and, and some people didn't love it because it's like you're glorifying McDavid and he's – what's he won? But – this is why I say he's the best player. It's the LeBron conversation where who is the best player in the league? It's LeBron and then whoever else has a great year. This season, you can make a great case for Kucherov and McKinnon having better seasons than McDavid. Who is the best player in the league? It's Connor McDavid. Crazy how I can say that so confidently. Oh, it's nuts. There was, what was it? Middle of November, he was a hundred and like twelfth or something like that in league scoring. Yeah, and then he's just like, you know what? Yeah, it's it's also like this is a great year for the NHL in terms of tight races for the Art Ross. Kale McCarr just overtook Quinn Hughes for defensive scoring. The actual like league standings. Not only do you not know who's going to win the Stanley Cup this year, like there's no really clear all out favorites. Who's going to win the President's Trophy this year? It's close. Vancouver has 98 points. The New York Rangers have 104 points. The New York Rangers are first overall in the league. The Vancouver Canucks are seventh. Even the Edmonton Oilers have 94 points and they have two games in hand on the Rangers. Like this could seriously go in any direction. The Rangers, Dallas, Carolina, Boston, Colorado, Florida, Vancouver, Edmonton, even Winnipeg. Those are nine teams. I guarantee you, you can find big name NHL pundits across the board who would pick all nine of those teams as their own cup favorite, like any individual one. I'm sure the NHL will do its absolute best to market <laughs> this, capture this, get new eyes on the league and really generate some additional revenue. The West, especially like the first rounds in the West, the central, like one team in the central might have to play the Nashville predators, maybe more likely, you know, the LA Kings or something. But it's going to be, as of right now, Colorado versus Winnipeg. That is a huge first-round matchup. If Vancouver has to play Nashville, Edmonton and Vegas rematch. Like Those are some. Which of those teams are you discounting and saying, yeah, they're definitely going to be first-round exits? 
Well, the Rangers will be shaking in their boots when the the Red Wings walk into Madison Square Gardens for games one and two, I'll tell you that much. Well, they will be. Chris Kreider is going to be having flashbacks looking down the ice in the Red Wings crease. Is that Jimmy Howard? (laughs) 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 At this point, we'll try anything. (laughs) Well, credit to Lyon. He's had a couple good games now, so maybe that's that's coming back there. But he's had... Jimmy Howard in New York levels of good games. Man, that was his thing. Eh? That like, was absolutely his thing. I'll never forget it. One of the very few losses in New York in the Jimmy Howard era, he literally lost one nothing in overtime. I remember that. It, <laughs> and we were almost pissed. You're like, wow, how are you guys not going to pull that one out for him? <laughs> uh, elsewhere across the league, Philadelphia has under very kind of old school, it was all clandestine and there wasn't a lot of information until he was over but you know his contract was ended in russia ivan fedotov six foot eight goaltender has had his contract terminated in the khl and he is now officially playing for the philadelphia flyers for the rest of the season he'll be a ufa at the end of the year six foot eight that is the exact pads are almost up to the the crossbar his pads brad would have to reach up to grab the top of his pads what did you say at the beginning of the show or before we recorded? Just go five hole. <laughs> Never seen him play a game. Don't know anything about him as a goalie. Five hole. Maybe. Yeah. But you that... can't make upper body saves because they're seven feet over the net. Yeah. If you hit him in the chest, you were putting it into the third row. Maybe yeah. reconsider your shot. Alex Debrink, it's like somehow get me shooting on this guy. I wouldn't miss so badly right now. <laughs> and speaking of Russia, it just has nothing to do with the Red Wings, but Red Wings fans are going to notice. But Sergei Fedorov has... Uh, no longer has a coaching job in the KHL as of right now. So, I'm sure that helped uh, Red the Wings discourse. discourse lately. Oh, yes. God, yeah. Yeah. If I'm saying everyone needs to breathe, that's rough. That's not good. <laughs> no. That's not good at all. Because usually Evan walks into my house and laughs at how stressed I am about something. Yes. So you're saying he's available for ceremonies next year. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. All right, why don't we jump into Overtime in this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast. Overtime, again, is brought to you by our Patreon supporters, patreon.com slash winged wheel podcast. You get the bonus episodes, you get the giveaways, and you also get the Patreon exclusive Discord. You allow us to continue to produce uh, this show and make it bigger and better. You allow us to produce Expected by Whom, hosted by Prashant Iyer and Sean Shapiro. Additionally, you allow us to support the Jamie Daniels Foundation through various initiatives. So again, patreon.com slash winged wheel podcast. Let's take some questions from our patrons. Datsuk for the Rafters says, is it wrong to be hopeful? Game in hand on Philly. Brother, that's the only thing I think is right right now because anything else is just unpredictable. The only thing that you can draw certainty from in this situation is mathematically where Detroit is in the standings and you are allowed to have hope in this weird game of hockey because anything can happen. Yeah, but. Ah, you're there's an, there, I liked it better when you were gone. There's an asterisk to this question. Is it wrong to be hopeful? Only if you don't care about your own personal well-being and mental health. We are all watching <laughs> the NHL. Where have you seen the past nine years? <laughs> Evan, yes. That's why I'm giving him this question we are to all preface ben his a- We are all Ben Affleck hacking that dart <laughs> outside on the streets. My, I, was a, I was home to see my family for, for Easter weekend. And my parents, any of you who are Middle Eastern will know, this is just kind of how Middle Eastern parents speak, very matter-of-factly. My dad's looking at me this morning, and he looks at my mom and goes, oh, his hair's falling out fast, huh? Wow. (laughs) I thought you were going to say, you just walked through the front door, they looked at you, you've aged. (laughs) Essentially, that's what they're saying. Rapidly. And I will say, I think a lot of that is because part of my job in life has become covering the Detroit Red Wings. So, Yeah. Is uh, we're not doing this for our mental health for sure. The stress we're, never goes away; it just transforms into some other facet. We'll be yeah. stressed out about something else when the Red Wings are actually good. We'll be stressed about the playoffs. Yeah, we don't know what playoffs. I forget what playoff but, stress is like. But you know what that is, Ryan? Fun, good stress. Yeah, that's yeah, why we do it. Fun. Yeah, yeah but sorry. Uh, pro- pro- hey, we can start prospect profiles. Those are fun. We only not, we, not they were for a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's not. It's not great when you have to profile like 35 players and the Red Wings pick none of them. It's just wasted knowledge. <laughs> hey, we've the last three years of their four first round picks or five first round picks, we've had profiles on them. We've gotten very good at t- honing in. The last one 
they picked in the first round we didn't do a profile on was cider. And we still talked about him. A little bit. No, no. We did a whole thing of, hey, not in the first round, but here are guys where you would love if somehow they fell to the second. <laughs> Brian Vasher says, I'm looking at this offseason and wondering how Eisenman gets rid of both bad D contracts. I also wonder how fast Raymond and Cider get extended. All right. Here's the first thing we need to mention. And Ryan and I had a bit of an extended conversation about this before the episode. Jeff Petrie has a no move clause. His contract has been retained twice already. So it cannot be retained again. So long story short, that is unmovable. Unless he retires. You have to, he has to retire or you have to really add a a sweetener to trade him to a team that isn't on his modified no trade list. In my opinion, there's bigger and more expensive and more pressing buyouts. So I wouldn't even waste it on him. Samuel Soderholm says, as me and some buddies were watching the game last night, we started discussing the officiating. Can you guys explain to me how Kachuk can just put Raymond in a chokehold without consequences? Isn't the instigator penalty a thing anymore? Or is that just if you drop the gloves? That rule specifically is just for dropping the gloves. The instigator rule specifically is just for dropping the gloves fights. What would stop a ref from these types of scrums is singling guys out. If in the first two scrums of a game, you give a team a power play, they're going to stop that crap because they're not going to risk it. But as Ryan so perfectly put it during the episode, NHL refs are cowards. They're not going to do that. I uh, The biggest change refs can make, I don't want every single scrum to, to end in a man advantage. I don't think that's good for the game. But when a team has a plan that is very obviously playing, like daring the refs to call something, you have to make a decision on how you're going to call it. And unfortunately right now, Florida has for some reason been given grace because of their reputation as a team that does this. And it, it's, if you don't come out and do the exact same thing, which is kind of asinine because you're running the risk of the refs looking at you saying, Hey, the Red Wings never play like this. So we're going to call them. And it's notable. You lose the match and it's stacked against you. Ekblad's not even a tough guy. It's not like he's, you know, Radko Gudas out there where he can back it up with a massive hit. Like He's made of glass. A strong breeze has hurt him before. You notice when Rasmussen was actually like, all right, let's go. How quickly Ekblad skated backwards away. It's just, it's ironic, like the pun's intended here, but it's rat behavior from Florida. And it works. That's the kind of gritty, grindy stuff that that wears down teams in the playoffs and gets them to make mistakes. Cletus says this whole season feels like a flashback to being a teenager. Lots of mixed emotions, highs, lows, lots of stupidity, and some really fun moments while they lasted before hitting the brick wall that is reality. Wow, that's apt. Jeez, I call that 18 holes, but still. We know now that this team is a fringe playoff team and possibly could be stuck there for a bit longer. How do they go on such long losing streaks like December and now? It seems like no one in management or the coaching staff has to answer for it. What else would or could you blame for the inconsistency and streakiness? Oh, where do you want to start? Tune in for the entire (laughs) offseason. You said something, Brad, earlier this episode, and... You know, we record twice a week. You hear us for probably three hours every week, near on 100 episodes a year. But don't lose fact that something that's true at the start of the season often is true at the end of the season. The roster, by and large, is that case. You didn't see the roster change a lot over the season. So the the issues over the course of the year, sometimes they were a little less bad than others. Sometimes the team covered for it. Sometimes they flared up. It, it's This is the roster as it's constructed. So even when they play a good game, if they play a good game against a cup competitor, they're still going to lose in a shootout. And that's to me, the the biggest culprit. Like you want to be mad. If I maintain, you can be mad at Lalonde hundred percent. Absolutely. No one on this team is without any, some kind of culpability here. But if you're mad at Lalonde, then you have to be mad at Eisman too. Is is Larkin culpable at all? Yeah. (laughs) Larkin. Because I can't think of a fault for him. Larkin, Raymond, for for most points. Stop caring so much. Yeah, yeah. Evans RBF, and I think I know what that stands for. I'll let you work it out. I know what it is. Oh, that's good. Uh, Says, hey, guys, I have two questions. First, do you still trust the Iser plan? It's hard to trust a process that still hasn't brought any success. Also, would you rather have this team miss the playoffs so it motivates them for next season or make the playoffs and get their asses kicked in the first round? Love the pod, guys. Keep up the great work. Well, make the playoffs for sure. I'm fully on. You're going to learn from this season no matter what, and the lessons now aren't going to be undone by making the playoffs. The only thing making the playoffs gets you is two things. One, an opportunity to make magic happen, which any team can do it. 
And two, you learn. Even if you lose four straight, you'll learn. And that's what I want this team to get from this. There's there's no benefit to missing the playoffs right now. And as for the Iser plan, not enough time in the day to go through that. Mostly on board. Hate a lot of his signings. Don't love his drafting philosophy. But beyond that, he's been dealt a bad hand that he hasn't been able to do a lot with. You know, we keep talking about this team needs superstar talent. That's what they're lacking the most. That's what they need. Where's been his opportunity to get it? So it, it's easy to criticize like the minutia of it, which in the off season, believe me, I will. But <laughs> but Brad's overall, nothing if not a man of his word. Yeah. But overall, yeah, he's he's pretty much been on point with what he's tried to do. I think his pro scouting department's let him down in a lot of instances. But again, that's not fully on him. But yeah, like, what do you want the guy to do? What, given what his options have been, you said something earlier this episode, Brad. You know, it's about the the middle ground. The minutia actually is a good way to describe it too. It's nuanced, and that's what I think this is. Do I think Eisenman's done a lot of things really well? Yes. Do I think there were some unforced errors? Yeah. Am I sitting here saying they are going to ruin everything for the Red Wings? No. But I also believe that more moves have to be made, not just to undo the mistakes, but still move forward because this job isn't done. So do you still trust, you know, the Iser plan, which is to say, do you, are you still happy with Eisenman as the GM? Yeah, I, I am as a fan. Yes, absolutely. And from overall evaluating how he's done. Yeah, I don't think it's been perfect, but to expect perfect would be unrealistic. I think this off season is going to be the most important because the last two off seasons, you can understand fully at some point this team needed to hit the gas. They didn't weren't in a position to go big game hunting at that point. He did what he did. Could you argue he went maybe a year early? Sure. But in the grand scheme of things, is that going to really make or break anything they're doing? No, of course not. I, I think in my mind this summer, there needs to be a very clear, I'll call it shift. He has to be past the point of, veteran stop gaps Mm -hmm. it either needs to be youth or stars Mm -hmm. and if he continues on the same path that he's followed the last couple years to me that would be extremely short-sighted and would maybe shift my overall positivity of the iser plan but again he might not have a choice given what the market will dictate given what the system looks like now at least Thanks to the Griffins, it's looking like that's a very good option because they look very good and they have a lot of prospects who look like they could step in next year. But I, I think this is the offseason that's really going to define what his motivations are. Give Walman the Heart says, if the Wings have only one rookie forward next season, who do you think it will be? Assign a percent chance to Casper, Mazur, Danielson, and other. I'm going to go 40, 30, 30, and I'm going to give Casper the 40. Okay. And then other, you'd give what, 10%? Not even. I don't don't think there is another. I will say 35 Casper, 35 Danielson, 25 Mazer, 5% other, just because I think anything can happen. I think Danielson did so well this past training camp that I actually think he has a better chance. Eh, I I should probably give Casper the edge by a percent. I give Casper the edge just because he's done it in the AHL for a year. It's easy to forget because there are different drafts that Casper and Danielson are the same age. Mm-hmm. Cause Danielson was just a late birthday in his draft year. I still maintain pretty adamantly Danielson's ceiling is much higher, but Casper is likely more polished. Yeah. And again, not how I would operate, but knowing how the Red Wings operate, that's going to be their highest priority is the guy who's going to make less mistakes, which will be Casper if we're talking about next year. So that's why I'm giving him the extra little bump in the percentages. All right, let's wrap up this episode of the Wind Wheel Podcast. Thank you all so very much for tuning in. We are going to be back with you on Wednesday. The Tampa Bay game will have been played. I would love to say we have more of an idea, but God knows that won't be the case. So we're going to be score watching, and we're obviously going to be hoping that the Red Wings can close out this road trip with a very tough win. But for now, thank you all so much for tuning in. Thank you to Labatt Blue Light for sponsoring the Wind Wheel Podcast and to all of our Patreon supporters for making the show possible. To all of our listeners, new and old, welcome to the show, or thanks for tuning in continually, and to all of our name-level supporters on Patreon. 
Arjun Shankar, Eves Bartels on behalf of the Sarah Grand Foundation, Akefer, Samuel Soderholm, Icon, Brad's Lord and Savior, Bradley Cleveland, Glenn Brabham, Croner's Left Knee, Ashley Van Conant, Keenan O'Donoghue, Yanni Burgers, Meals on Wheels, Matthew M. Rice, Mo Siders, Fight Card, Admiral Matt S. at the Cheesebag Navy, Carl Brutana Nanaluski, Carl Provi, Susan High Five, Clip Clop Nene, Connor Scovey, Craig Kibble, Denny's Gamer Girl, Derek N. Stam Dickens, Cider, formerly Marlon Winchester, DJ Denton, Fear the Goalie, God Creatives, Give Blood Fight Probert, Have You Ever Drank Baileys from a Shoe, Hockey Town Love, Hockey Town Matt, Hassam al Qasem, Jay Gollum, Jacob Turner, Joel Miranda, Jonathan Miller, Kaylin Wood, Marcus, Matt Keeler, Matt McKay, Michael Edland, R.A., Red Feather Desert Dogs, Ryan 50, Hannah Cap, Hannah, Scott Martin, Shane Patch of Perpetual Ads, Skeletor, Scree and Lube, That's What I Appreciate it's About You, Wallman's Elite Dancing D, Iser Plan Stan, General Andy Bohan of the Cheesebag Army, Sam Bankson, A.B., Adam Rose, Axel's Sandy Pelica, Bellingham Acid Balls, Big Chungus, Brad Simmons, Brian Vasha, Chuck Buffchest, the Tarpless Goon, Commander Ben Barron of the Cheeseback Space Force, Connor Layton and Corey Prita, Darren Fick, D-Boss Snip Show, Derek James, Frank Stanley, Gene Sullivan, Griffey Boy, Insert Clever Hockey Pun Here, James Pridemore, Johnny Page, Jeremiah Dobo, J.M. Rhapsody, Jogan Rafferty Fan Club, John Evans Derogatory, John Ingalls, Josh Yelton, Kevin McCracken, Quaz, Les Grossman's Ungodly Firestorm, Linda Hull, Maximilian, Michigan Boy in Avs Country, Ophelia, Red Wing Tar Heel, Shahid Syed, Stephen, The Hodag, The Mexinadian, The Hat 123, Tom Iserplan Respector, Wings Fan in St. Louis, Scott, ex formerly AA Ron, and your second favorite patron. Thank you all so very much. We'll see what happens. Thanks for tuning in to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Be sure to check out wingedwheelpodcast.com, where you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You'll also find links to other ways to support the show, such as Patreon, official podcast apparel, and more. And don't forget to follow the show on Twitter at Winged Wheel Pod. And of course, the hosts at Brad Crisco, at Ryan Hanna WWP, and at Hockey Town Evan.